So how did I get sciatica in the first place? Coming up next. To really heal from sciatica and correct this pain in your body, it's very important to understand how you got here in the first place. How did I get this horrible sciatica? How am I gonna help it go away? Well, there's lots of opinions about how to make it go away. And I'm hoping that this month, now we're at week three already, that this month that I'm sharing a lot of information and the information I'm choosing to share is what I find are key missing pieces in the sciatica puzzle, key understanding and key practices that I have seen work thousands of times and including in my own body for healing sciatica. And one of the things that is so crucial is understanding how you got it in the first place. Because if you understand how you got it, then you can do the steps to correct so that you aren't doing the same things over and over again. Because you see, sciatica isn't something that just suddenly happens. It may feel like it's something that suddenly happens, but it's actually based in patterns that you have developed in your body over a long period of time. We don't see four-year-olds with sciatica. We don't even see often 10-year-olds in sciatica. Now we're seeing people who are younger with sciatica, maybe teens, people in their 20s, but it's really due to the things that they have been doing in their bodies and the way they've been using their bodies over time. And the number one cause of sciatica is posture, is posture. Ah, oh, something so simple to pay attention to, but something that many people don't really fit as a piece of their sciatica puzzle. One of the key elements I've been discussing and will continue to discuss through this month is having one hip higher than the other. It is very rare in my experience, tens of thousands of bodies I've worked with and humans I've worked with, it's very rare in my experience to see someone with a true leg length inequality. And actually, it's kind of difficult to diagnose. What I have seen is that when people start addressing the tensional systems that can make it look like you have a leg length inequality or that can leave you with one hip higher than the other, then you can really make changes in your experience and get rid of that sciatica for good. Now, scoliosis is a true cause of sciatica. In scoliosis, the, when there's lumbar, low, low back scoliosis, and the spine is curving and also often twisting and rotating, there will be compression on nerves. And that is something that can be difficult to address, scoliosis. And at the same time, I've worked with people with fairly severe scoliosis in their 60s and 70s, where they say, Kat, the work I learned from you, that ball stuff, the things, she's, I, one woman said specifically, no one's ever given me tools to really work with myself except you. And no one, I've never been able to do the PT or whatever and actually get myself out of pain. She's like, with your practices, I'm able to get relief for maybe a day, maybe a couple of days. And then hopefully that will build that length of time where she's experiencing relief. And she has a true scoliosis that is very, that her spine is twisting and rotating. We can give ourselves functional scoliosis just by the way we stand. If we stand like this, and this is why I think we're seeing younger people because isn't this the like, whatever teenager <laughs> position, right? Like whatever, right? This like standing with the hip out, that is effectively creating a scoliotic curve in your spine. It, this side of the pelvis is high, this side, the QL, is short and drawn in and more about the QL in the next couple days. And then this side is long and drawn out and that QL is hanging and the spine is opening up to my left side in this position. So if you are habitually standing with your weight off to one side, this may be what's leading you to have sciatica symptoms in your body. Oh, it doesn't even feel good to do that. If you habitually sit over on one side of the couch, right? Burn your couch. 
if you always cross the right leg over the left. Every time you cross one leg over the other, that hip of the leg that's on top is going to sit higher. If you chronically fold one leg underneath you while you sit, that's gonna push that hip up higher. Every time you affect the hips, you affect the lumbar spine. And this may be the root cause of your sciatica symptoms. So your posture is crucial. You must pay attention to your posture when you want to change sciatica symptoms because also in this scenario, this side, my right hip, those muscles are like, ah, they're hanging on for dear life. And that glute min lives in there, gluteus minimus. And that gluteus minimus is the sciatica imitator. It can give you all the symptoms. This QL is all scrunched up. The nerve bundles can get stuck in there. This side, my QL is hanging long and the nerve can get compressed on that side, giving sciatica symptoms on the low hip side. Either way, your body doesn't like it. Your body doesn't like you to stand with one hip higher than the other. And over time, it can look like you have a leg length inequality. It takes very precise x-rays. In my understanding, it takes very precise x-rays to actually tell if you have a leg length inequality. Many of my clients that come in to see me and have over the years have one hip that sits higher than the other. For many of them, it creates sciatica symptoms. For some of them, it sets their torso off. The right hip gets high, the shoulder gets high, this side of their neck is in pain. For some of those people, it creates chronic headaches. For some of those people, it creates shoulder issues. For some of those people, it creates hip problems, low back problems, even knee problems. It's a very common pattern that I see this one hip higher than the other. Now, if we aren't releasing the trigger points, the tension, that muscle memory tension that's being lodged in the muscles, that pattern will keep repeating and reinforcing one hip higher than the other. It takes a lot of awareness to change your posture. I get it. It takes a lot of awareness and presence and mindfulness to stop crossing your legs. Sometimes I still catch myself crossing my legs. I'm like, oh, don't do that, <laughs> right? Because over time, it's just going to keep setting one hip high. Even a herniated disc doesn't just happen suddenly. Over time, the lumbar spine gets short on one side and flared open on the other side. The discs start to protrude out from the spine and they're pushed, 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 and at some point, the edge of that disc wears thin and the nucleus pops out and now you have technically a herniated disc. And that herniation, that nucleus of that, of that disc could be what's pressing on the sciatic nerve. The fact is all of the things that I'm teaching you this month will help even with a herniated disc. Some people walk around with a herniated disc with zero pain. Some people can heal. I was diagnosed with a herniated disc and within less than a week, I was completely out of pain. And I went to see a chiropractor. I don't see chiropractors very often, but I was like, I can't really move and I'm in excruciating pain. And my chiropractor said, Kat, this isn't something you're just gonna be able to roll around on balls and get rid of. I was like, okay. So I went home, I rolled around on my balls. I just needed to make sure I didn't need to go have an MRI or something. I rolled around on my balls, I did posture work, I strengthened that side. You're gonna learn that very spe specific practice tomorrow. And within a week, I went back for, in a week, I was like, I'm moving like 90% fine, I'm totally fine. He said he'd never seen anyone heal so quickly from a herniated disc. And it's that you can shift the tensional balance in your body out of imbalance into balance. You can adjust your posture, the way you sit, the way you stand, the way you walk, the way you stop and talk to people. If every time you stop and talk to someone and you go like this, hey, what's up, great to see you, and you're pushing that right hip out, you're wreaking havoc on your low back and your hips and really setting yourself up for continuing sciatica symptoms in your body. 
Sciatica is a result of tensional imbalances in your body, either in the low back or in the hips or glutes or butt, like piriformis, which I think gets blamed too often for sciatica symptoms, that poor piriformis. To really stop having this pattern, you have to pay attention. Try to not stand with your weight on one side. So I'm going to attach some videos after I stop talking, you'll be able to see what is good posture? What does that mean? Because there's really different um, understanding of and, and sort of incorrect understanding of what good posture is. Too many people tuck the pelvis under. When you tuck the pelvis under, it flattens the lumbar curve and then can cause sciatica symptoms. A woman's pelvis is designed to be slightly tilted forward. So if you go to someone and they go, oh, you have an anteriorly tilted pelvis and you're a woman, give them a high five. Woohoo! my body's doing what it's meant to do. A woman's pelvis, not too much. It's a, it's a balance. Everything's about a balance. You're not meant to walk with your butt way back here, but you are meant to have a slight tilt in the pelvis, especially women because that's what gives you a lumbar curve. If you're walking around tucked under, or if you hang out at the counter like this and lean against the counter, you have annihilated the lumbar curve in your back and no good can come of that. Tensional balance or imbalance happens over time. It might seem sudden that that disc herniated, but it's been coming for a long time, maybe many years. And at some point you just did a lift and twist or you tried to kick a ball real hard or did something, shoveling, something, even a sneeze, right? I've had people come in and go, I just sneezed and my, <laughs> my back went out, now I got the sciatica. It's something that's been set up over time. You must look at your posture. So stick around, watch these videos. I'm gonna give you instructions on sitting well and standing well in what I call active posture. Because active posture, there is an action of lengthening the crown of your head up to the sky, and that's not the only piece, but lengthening the crown of the head, which tractions the spine, which decompresses all the discs and allows for more space for all the nerve roots, not just the sciatic nerve. So super important, sciatica happens over time. It might hit you suddenly, but it's been building for a long time and your posture and the way you sit and the way you stand and the way you walk and the way that you hang out in your body is a number one cause of your sciatica symptoms. So check it out, watch the posture videos. I'm Kat here at Free Body. Keep going, we got this. All right, time to do some posture training. It is so important how you hold and carry your body because you can do all the PT, all the exercises, all the foam rolling, all the breath work, all the targeted stretching and strengthening and all the things, but then if you just get on your couch and slouch or if you walk around all slumped over, not carrying your body well, you're not going to heal. We are gonna break it down. What is active posture? What does that mean? How can I get into active posture? And then how can I practice it walking around? Okay, so number one rule of active posture, burn your couch. <laughs> Don't sit in a couch. Don't allow yourself to sit on a couch and slouch. Allow yourself only to sit on firm chairs where you're able to sit up and practice and strengthen in good posture, and then become aware of how you stand. So I'm gonna walk you through standing in active posture and then walking in active posture and then sitting in active posture. So first part, standing in active posture. The first thing we wanna keep in mind is that we want our backs are designed to have a lumbar curve. And so if you are tucking your pelvis under, right? If you're spending too much time in that tuck, you're gonna be annihilating, removing that lumbar curve. And as we know, that's not helpful. So if you're a tucker or if you're a leaning forward person thrusting your pelvis out, you wanna especially be mindful to bring your attention into the inner groins right here. The inner groins on either side of kind of the pubic bone, right at the intersection, at the top of the inseam of your pants. You wanna take those inner groins back. What you'll feel is your weight moves back 
towards your heels a little bit. So that weight moves back a little bit, helps you get more grounded in your heels, and it establishes that lumbar curve. We want to not be stuck in a tuck. We want to bring those groins, soften the groins back. Now it's going to feel like you're sticking your chest out, and your chest may actually be protruding at this point. Bring your attention into your lower ribs. Tuck those lower ribs in, draw them back. Okay, so that balances the tilting of the pelvis by re reaching those inner thighs back, inner groins back, and then tuck the lower ribs in the front in. That kind of balances that. And you have to play, you have to find that sweet spot in your body. In the beginning, if you're a tucker, which most of you are, <laughs> or if you're stand on weight with on one leg more than the other, you're gonna find this feels like you're really just sticking your butt out. And your body has to get used to this new position because your body is attuned to the tuck. So we're resetting your whole nervous system to be willing to accept this new posture, right? So it's gonna feel weird. It's okay for it to feel weird and different inner groins back, lower ribs draw in, back ribs now rise up to the sky. This is the traction part. And then the crown of the head even rises up to the sky. You're literally tractioning your spine between heaven and earth. You're reaching the crown of your head up, still those groins stay back. And then can you move in that position? So can you keep the most important thing in movement is to keep thinking about reaching the crown of the head up. Like you're almost gonna, it's almost gonna lift you up on your tiptoes. Now my mom, when I was a teenager, had me walk around sometimes with a book on my head to train me in good posture. At the time, I was of course horrifically irritated by this. Now I'm like, hey, good job mom, that actually works. So you wanna have a small box, or you can use your yoga block, which is a little bit bigger, so it might be a little bit harder to balance. Or I have this block, you want to, you can practice with a soft cover book, but this will curve around your body, around your head a little bit more. It's sometimes easier to cheat a little bit with the soft book, however, what it will do is give you something to push your head into, right? So I'm gonna use this little box, and I'm gonna place it on the top of my head. Now I'm gonna show you, it's very hard to like stand with your weight on one side. <clears throat> it's very hard to slouch. Whoop. It's very hard to tuck the pelvis forward and keep that box on top of the head. You have to have good posture. Have you ever watched a little kid learn how to walk, a toddler learn how to walk? At that age, their head is the biggest, heaviest part of their bodies. So they're kind of like this, right? <laughs> and they have their butt sticking out a little bit. Look at little babies and toddlers as they're learning. Their butt is sticking out a little bit. Get those glutes working for you instead of tucking them under and shutting them all down. That is not helping you at all, right? So allow your butt to come back a little bit Put that little box on your head. Push the crown of your head up into the box and walk around. Can you walk around in good posture, pressing the crown of the head up into the box like you're trying to push the box up to the ceiling? Give it a try, give it a try. It's actually, this has actually liberated many of my clients and students from their bad posture habits because the box doesn't lie, the book doesn't lie. It's gonna let you know if you're hanging out more on one side than the other. It's gonna let you know if you're tucked and slouched. It's gonna let you know if you're overarching in the back because your head will not be level. Hey friends, popping in here real quick to let you know that Sunday, September 25th, 2022, 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be live right here on the YouTube channel. I want to answer your questions, so write some things down. If you have concerns, if you have questions, join me live here on the YouTube channel Sunday, September 25th, 2022 at 4 p.m. I'll see you there.
now we're gonna go through active posture sitting. So remember, standing, you're tractioning your spine. You can also traction your spine while you're sitting at the same time. You want to make sure that you're not allowing yourself to sit in your couch and that you're not allowing yourself to sit at the back of a chair because the back of a chair tends to kind of get us into slouching and slumping or leaning off to one side. Maybe you're always like crossing one leg underneath you and this is setting the pelvis all off. So you wanna notice what your habitual patterns are for when you're sitting. And then when you are sitting, you wanna sit well and actually let your posture be healing to your body instead of harming to your body. So you're gonna have a sturdy chair and you're gonna sit and you're gonna scoot yourself more toward the front of that chair. Now you can see already that I'm already in a good position. It's hard for me, <laughs> it's hard for me in general because I've worked on my posture for so long. Like I pretty much always have good posture. I'm not hanging out in a tuck, I'm not slouching. I don't ever sit on a couch, right? And now I never have low back pain or my, sci or my sciatica that's been gone for years and years, right? So you wanna sit up well. And you wanna bring the same principles into active posture sitting as we do with standing. So those principles are maintain the curve, the normal natural curve of your lumbar spine. Maintain the normal natural curve of your lumbar spine, which is a little bit of a lordosis. It means lengthening the spine up toward the sky and balancing that tilt of the pelvis with a gentle drawing in of the front ribs and opening and widening the back ribs just a little bit, just enough to counter so that you're not over exaggerating right, that whole lumbar curve. You don't want to sit like this. Right? And it's interesting, I see folks who are trying to co correct their posture, they tend to do this, right? Well, eh, not so much, a little bit, that's a little bit overdone. Okay, so here's what you want to do. You want to place your feet on the floor, hip distance apart-ish. You want to feel both sitting bones on the chair. You want to tilt that pelvis a little bit. Those inner groins move back. Get a lumbar curve first thing. Balance it. And remember, it's going to feel overdone in the beginning until your body's used to it. Draw the lower ribs in just a little bit so that your back ribs can kind of open and rise up to the crown of the head. And then the crown of the head is rising up toward the sky. And then soften everything a little bit. Can you then, once you get into it, can you then relax a little bit there? Now I sit, I sit for hours like this without a problem. And I can sit for meditation for long periods of time without a problem, without pain in my back, without pain in my neck, without my shoulders, without like, oh, feeling like I need to get out of it because I've been working on it for a while. So in the beginning, it's gonna feel tiring, but I promise you that over time, this posture is going to be healing for your body and you'll never ever want to sit in bad posture again. I never want to sit in bad posture. I try sometimes to sit on a couch it doesn't work. After just a couple minutes, I'm like, oh, it feels terrible. <laughs> it just feels terrible in my whole body, right? So sitting bones grounded toward the front of the chair, rolling the, the, toward the front of the sitting bones to establish that lumbar curve. Low ribs draw in just a little bit, just to make sure that you're not kind of thrusting too far forward, right? You wanna still stay anchored on your sitting bones. Lower ribs draw in, back ribs rise up, crown of the head rises up to the sky. And then relax everything just a little bit so that it feels a little slightly less effortful. And this is active posture in a chair. And this is the posture that you want to be sitting in most of the time, pretty much any time that you're sitting. Notice I did not say cross one leg over the other. 
Notice I said feet about hip distance apart, and I didn't say put your knees together, right? Notice this is the position toward the front of the chair and sitting up well and tall and using the strength of your body to lengthen your spine and lift yourself up, healing your back, keeping yourself from damaging your back and your spine any further, pulling some of that dysfunction out of your body with your posture so that you can feel good, so you feel good in your life and do the things you wanna do.